Uh, welcome to Church Online. Wherever you're joining us today, we hope you're having a great morning. We hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are. Uh, maybe you're sitting in bed watching us, maybe you're around the dining table, maybe you're sitting in a lounge room, wherever you are. Uh, we're just delighted that you, you're with us today. And, and our hope is that uh, this will be an opportunity for you to connect with others, to connect with God, uh, to, uh, to perhaps have your faith stretched or moved along in, in some way. Uh, if, you, if you're a regular, can we encourage you to do a couple of things? Just one, maybe text somebody or send a message and remind them that church is on and invite them to join us. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, can you also subscribe to our channel? It, just, it helps us get the word out about uh, what's happening here at FFBC. It makes it easy, easier for people to find. It uh, also means for you, you just get notifications when uh, a service is about to begin or when we post something online. So you don't have to go looking. It, it'll be there for you all the time. Uh, as always, we just want to also recognize those that are giving. We want to thank you. Uh, and your, your giving makes a difference. And uh, uh, your participation in what God is doing here makes a difference. Uh, it's really easy just to participate in what we're doing financially. You just jump online. You go to our webpage, ffbc.org.au. Go to the online giving section. The bank details are there. I think we're all used to that. And, and that allows us to continue on the, the mission and the focus that we're on at the moment and as we continue to try to pursue uh, the work of this church. Uh, also, uh, I want to thank everybody that came to Ethos last Tuesday night. It was an excellent night. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you're on our distribution list, if you get our updates each week, later on today, you'll get this week's update, which will give you a bit of a recap of the material that we covered over in our Ethos meeting. So look out for that. It may even be popping in your boxes as we talk about this right now. Uh, if you uh, would like to get... Uh, a regular update from us and you're not on the sub subscription list, just let us know and uh, we'll put you on that list. And then each week we just send out an update. Sometimes it's a reflection on the message before and, and it's about various things that are happening in the life of the church, uh, events that are coming up uh, and uh, talk, we talk about our strategy and, and a whole range of different things. So it's well worth getting onto our subscription list for the, the weekly update. Uh, also, you may or may not be aware of this, we actually have a kids program each Sunday morning. And if you've got kids and you'd like them to be involved in that, uh, contact us and we'll, hand on, we'll pass on the details. And they do teaching, they do it in the Zoom format and we'll give you the links to that. And they can just jump on their own computer or device and connect with a bunch of others. Uh, so that's on every Sunday morning. Generally around this time, they'll head off and do their own thing while the rest of us uh, continue on in worship and, and share a message together. Uh, we're going to take a moment to pray. Kath's going to pray for us. Uh, before Kath prays for us, actually, we're going to have uh, a mission spot from Gail. During September, we have been praying for Network Heaven. Uh, please remember to look at the website and uh, keep up to date with the information there. In October, we are focusing on Pip Minor. For those who don't know who Pip is, Pip has always been a passionate young woman who wanted to serve God in a variety of organisations and countries. <clears throat> She's also passionate about sport, running, swimming, playing team games. After leaving school, Pip uh, went to work in Hong Kong for Crossroads, and after a few years, she felt the need to come back to Australia and study to prepare where God was going to lead her next. She worked with the, <clears throat> the Narrabeen youth while she was studying for her degree in theology. She then joined Global Interaction and went off to Cambodia, where she worked with disadvantaged youth in a very difficult area. While there, she met Pern. After Pip had worked in Cambodia for nine years, she came back to Australia, Pern followed, and they got married. Pip then joined the plunge team at Morling College. The one-year course includes studying at Morling and a period of time overseas somewhere. <clears throat> While working at Morling, Pip also worked part-time at Gordon Baptist Church, where the family still worship. Pip is now part a, partnering, a partnership development consultant at Global Interaction. It has been fascinating to witness how Pip has followed God uh, where God has called her, enabling her to fulfill the posts that she has moved on to. In October, on October the 31st, Pip will be taking the service here and she will complete the story and encourage us 
as we use our gifts to serve the Lord. Would you join with me in prayer, please? Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we rejoice that our prayers are heard by you, are powerful because we pray in your name, are faith affirming, are needed, and we trust are effective. We want to thank you for the way you have led Pip over the years that we have known her. You have empowered her as she has strived to help people develop their own skills and most importantly come to a close relationship with you. We pray for those young Cambodians whose lives were changed and are now filled with hope and look to a future with your joy and love in their lives. We pray for those young Australians who grew in their faith as they learned more about you and learned to depend on you in different circumstances. We pray for Pip now as her role is to encourage Christians to deepen their faith and dependence on you by sharing your good news to others. We pray for all those who work at Global Interaction too. We want to include praying for the Harry family who have so many issues to contend with and for Katie and Steve in Hong Kong as they have a different situation to consider now too. We thank you that we can be part of their ministry as they serve you in far-flung places. May they know that they do not stand alone, but we uphold them before you too. We love you, Lord, and ask that you will empower us to serve you faithfully wherever we are. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are so loving. And I thank you that you love to fill us with your peace. So today, Lord, we thank you that you are a God of peace and we lift up these people to you. We lift up to you people who have contracted coronavirus. And we lift up to you those who are in isolation because they've been in contact with people who have the virus. And we ask, Lord God Almighty, that you will come and you will bring them your peace. We pray, Lord, that you will bless those who need healing. And we ask, Heavenly Father, for those who are in quarantine, we ask that you will be providing them with a sense of purpose and reassuring them that their time at home is important, that they are protecting their loved ones and their community. We pray too, Lord God Almighty, for their families, that they will also experience your peace. Lord God Almighty, we lift up to you our first responders, our doctors, our nurses. We lift up to you people who need your protection, Lord, from the virus, and there are so many. But we know you are a mighty God. We know you are all powerful, and we know that you love and care about every single person. And so we do lift up our first responders, Lord. We pray that they will always be protected, that they'll have the protective equipment that they need and that they'll have all the medical supplies that they need so that they can take care of those who come to them. Lord, we also lift up to you today our politicians. And we pray, Lord God Almighty, that you'll be with our leaders, that you'll give them wisdom and peace as they make decisions. We ask, loving Heavenly Father, that we will also have the wisdom as we follow their directions. And I pray to mighty God for this week, for there has been so much that's been happening in Australia. We lift up to you the people who have been affected by the earthquake, and we pray, Lord, for provision for them, and that their houses, houses that have been damaged by the earthquake, Lord, will be fixed as swiftly as possible. We ask too, Lord, for those people who are involved in the protest, that they will know your presence, that they will know your peace, that they'll be able to find their rest in you and to know how much you love them. We lift up our own community to you today too, Lord, and I ask, I ask, Father, that we will have our eyes and ears and our hearts open, particularly as we read your word, so that during this season of the coronavirus, we'll understand what you are saying to us personally. And we pray that we'll be attentive to what you are saying to us today. Amen.
sins and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire take all I have in these hands and multiply
summer of 1979. I'm a latchkey kid. Uh, summer school holidays roll around and really because my brothers and I have nothing much else to do, we end up going to a, a school holiday program run by our, our local school. When we arrive there, we meet another kid by the name of Steve Folletti and we quickly become friends. But we notice something. Every morning, Steve Folletti is not there. He only ever turns up to the school holiday program in the afternoon. So we ask him, why? Why aren't you here in the morning? And he tells us he's at a vacation Bible school run by a, by a local church. And then Steve Folletti turns to us and he invites us to come. He invites me to come, someone he, he doesn't really know all that well, someone who has expressed no interest in faith or God or anything like that. He invites me to come to a vacation Bible school with him. I'd sort of had this nominal Catholic background. I had sort of gone to church occasionally. So I had a notion of God, a picture of God. God was big. He was present. I believed that there was God. I believed that he was, he was large and transcendent. But I never knew how to be certain in my relationship with God. I never knew how to get close to God. And so I went to that vacation Bible school. And over the course of the week or so, they answered every question that I had. And by the end of the week, they said, who wants to give their life to Christ? Who wants to follow Jesus? And I, I remember putting my hand up along my brothers and we all decided to follow Christ that, that day. 
that week. Or because a little guy by the name of Steve Folletti decided to invite us along to a vacation Bible school. Uh, do you have a Steve Folletti in your story, in your life? Do you have someone who was courageous enough to, to invite you to come and to hear about Jesus? Uh, is there a, a David Godfrey in your life? Someone that is just there and just waiting for you to invite them along to experience, to encounter, to know something about Jesus? And, and are you going to be courageous enough to, to invite them along? Uh, over this, from this week over the next few weeks, we're going to be diving deep into the book of, of Philippians, uh, the story of this extraordinary church that the Apostle Paul loved. And so today, we're actually not going to jump into the actual book of Philippians. We're going to look into the origins of the church. And the origins of church are recorded for us in, in Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, what happens is the Apostle Paul dares to believe that God wants him to go to this European city of Philippi. Uh, he's invited in somewhat dramatic fashion. There's, there's a vision. There's a man from Macedonia where, where that God gives him this vision of this man saying, come, come to us. We need you. And so he goes. And he goes to a city where he doesn't know anybody. He, he doesn't, uh, there's no synagogue. So he, he, his normal practice for Paul would be go to a city, go to the synagogue, talk about the Messiah there. But there's no option to do that. And yet he goes to this city. And when he arrives, he, he's not sure what to do and Sabbath rolls around. And so Paul goes down to by a river to find a place to pray. And listen to what happens when he arrives. Acts chapter 16 verses 13 to 15. On the Sabbath, we went outside. This is Luke writing. He's a companion of Paul. That's why you get the we. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to women who were gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded, and, and she persuaded us. So remember the scene, it's, it's Sabbath. Paul would normally go to the synagogue. There's no synagogue. He goes down to the river to pray. He goes outside the city gates. He goes to the river. He goes to pray. And there he finds a group of people gathered to do the exact same thing. There's a group of women that are praying. And one of them is a lady by the name of Lydia. Now, Lydia is interesting because we're told a few things about Lydia straight away. One is that she's a dealer in purple cloth and she's from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira was in Asia. It was, in, I think, modern day Turkey. Uh, it was a city that was known for manufacturing uh, wool and leather goods and linen. And particularly it was known for purple cloth. And Lydia is a seller in purple cloth. And purple cloth is really, really expensive. It's a sought-after commodity at that time, at that place. And so we know straight away that this is a woman who is of means. This is a woman who is independent. This is a woman who is wealthy. We also know something else about her. We're told this in verse 14. She was a worshipper of God. So we're told that not only is she a wealthy woman, she is a, a religious woman. She's, she's seeking after God. She's trying to, to get a handle on, on who God is and what he's like. In a hometown of Thyatira, there would have been a synagogue. There would have been a Jewish population, a Jewish community. And it wasn't uncommon for people of different faiths sometimes to be drawn across to the Jewish faith. They were drawn to monotheism. They were drawn to... The morality, the ethics of the Jewish faith. And maybe she's one of those. To say she was a worshipper of God, it's, it's like a technical term. It's for a Gentile that perhaps comes to the synagogue and starts to check things out. They hear the scriptures. They pay attention to the prayers. They want to live their life in accordance with the laws of God as found in the Hebrew scriptures. I think it's a fairly apt description of who this lady is. And when Paul meets her, she's with a group of friends. And here they are by the river and they're praying and perhaps they're reading scriptures. And what does Paul do when he encounters them? 
He turns to Lydia and he tells her about the message of Jesus. He talks to her. That's how this whole church starts because Paul goes and he talks. Maybe he asks her what she's reading. Maybe they talk about Moses and the prophets and the law and the coming Messiah. Maybe he goes on to say, hey, I, I know the Messiah. I've met the Messiah. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you how your life can be right with God. All those questions, those yearnings, those longings, those, those things that you've been wondering about. Let me show you how they're answered in Christ and, and maybe have this conversation. And we're told that she responds, she gets it. Uh, there's a sense in which it seems to be this, this rational, logical, considered exploration of faith. She's read, she's heard, she's understood. I think Lydia is someone who's, who's investigating faith. Uh, maybe you know somebody like Lydia. Maybe, maybe you are a Lydia. Yeah, and for you, if faith is, is a reasonable, logical step. You, you want to study and you want to read, you want to investigate. You, you've got questions you want to have answered. If they're answered if they're in a way that satisfies you, you, you would take that step. Well, that's Lydia. She, she is from Thyatira. She starts to worship God. She finds out about God. Now here she is by the, by the river in Philippi and she encounters Paul and he answers all the questions that she's got and she responds. So that's the first person that comes to faith. Now in, in Acts 16, we're actually given uh, a few different examples of different people that come to faith as this church emerges. And so is everybody in Philippi just like Lydia? Well, now what we find happens next is, is Paul actually encounters a very, very different kind of person. Her story is told in verses 16 to 18. We're told once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. I don't know if you paid attention to the type of woman this is, but in, in, in many ways, she's the exact opposite of Lydia. Lydia has status. Lydia has wealth. This woman has no status. She has no money. She's a slave. If Lydia has independence, this lady is the property of another person. You couldn't find two more opposite people. They're also very, very different spiritually. What do we know about Lydia? Lydia's been on this search, on this quest that's led her to, to explore faith. And she's open to having a discussion about faith. But there's, there's nothing about that in this woman. We don't know if she worships God. There's no indication that she's necessarily religious. All we know about her is that she's possessed by a spirit, by, by an evil spirit. Lydia was someone who was seeking God. But there's nothing in this story to suggest that this woman is seeking after God in any way. All we know is that she's possessed by a demon. And that she's hounding Paul and Silas. And she's hounding them and we're told this, verse 17. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. It's interesting. She, she knew something. It's not coming out of her own quest, her own yearning, we don't think. It, it's the fact that she's possessed by a spirit and who seems to know something. But in herself, we would suspect that she's in pain, that she's in turmoil, that, that she's almost compelled to do this. And she just keeps following these guys around. She keeps sort of annoying them. And so what happens next? How's, how's her life going to be changed? Verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Paraphrase. Paul says, I've had enough, quite frankly. Right? I, just, I want this woman to stop bothering us, to stop following us around, to stop hounding us. 
And so he does something for her. He, he uh, tells the, the evil spirit to leave her. But it's not for her sake. It's for his sake. It's not for her peace of mind. It's for his peace of mind. Paul in this moment, let's be honest. This is not Paul at his finest. Paul, Paul is incredibly, incredibly flawed at this moment. The only reason it seems to be from the text that he is actually praying this prayer, that he's intervening in the situation, is because he has just lost his patience. He's had enough. And he wants peace of mind for himself. It's not necessarily for her, but for himself. And I think that's interesting because so often we look at ourselves and we think of our own brokenness, our own shame, our limitations. And we think, oh, God couldn't use me in mission. How could I be any use to God? I, I make mistakes. I have a past. I, I'm, I'm conflicted at times. I, I don't know enough. And we think about all these reasons why God could never and should never use us in, in mission. But then read Acts 16. Because here's Paul in this incredibly flawed moment. And God uses him to save this woman. Because despite all Paul of Paul's brokenness, he knows that God can save this woman and God wants to save a woman like this. And what's, what's fascinating is how does she come to faith? Well, it's very, very different to Lydia, isn't it? There's no, there's no logic, there's no reasoned argument, there's no debate, there's no discussion, there's no unpacking of ideas. There's none of that goes on in this particular story. How she reached, she's reached through the miraculous, through this d demonstration of power, where she is possessed and then she's not because of the prayer of Paul and the action of God. And what's fascinating is that this woman doesn't just have demonic masters, she has human masters as well. And she's because of this so-called gift that she has because of possession. She's being exploited in more ways than she ought to be. And she's oppressed. And she, in this moment, ends up being liberated by the gospel. And it changes. The, 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 the demon is cast out. And her, and her owners no longer have this way of exploiting her the way that they have traditionally. The, the hope of making money out of her irrespective of the cost, irrespective of the torment, irrespective of the pain that this might bring her. They didn't care for any of that. It was just what, that she, what she brought for them. And, and now they have to see her as a human being rather than just an object they can use to make money. And Paul comes along and he heals her. And when he does, they are furious. In fact, we're told in verse 19, when the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. She's no longer a commodity that can be used. She's free of her torment. She's liberated. She's being set free spiritually. Her, her owners are furious that this opportunity is gone. Now, what's really interesting, is this lady a God-fearer? No. Is she seeking God? No. There's nothing to suggest that she has any interest in God, that she's seeking God, other than the declarations of the demons that are inside of her. The best thing that we can say about this lady is that she is perhaps spiritual. She knows something is going on. I mean, how can she not? She's got this demon in her. She's being able to tell future events. She's, she's a clairvoyant. She's a fortune teller because of this power that she's got. She, she clearly knows something is going on spiritually. But she knows that it is damaging her. She knows that it is hurting her. And she knows she needs to be saved. And maybe you know someone like this. Maybe you are someone like this. That you're spiritual. And, you, and, there's, and you know there's something going on, but there's also this torment, this unrest, there's something. And like this woman, perhaps you know what it's like to be oppressed. You know what it's like to be exploited. You know what it's like to, to need somebody to desperately intervene in your circumstance, in your life, and to rescue you. 
And after all, she decides all this, she decides to cry out to God. I mean, is not following Paul and Silas around declaring that these are the men who, who, who are servants of the living God? A cry for help, and she cries out to God. And so here we have Lydia, successful in her status. She's got wealth. She's asking questions. And, and here's Paul, and he answers the questions. And then we have this other woman. And she's spiritual, but she's, she's, she's owned. She's got no status. She's got no power. She's tormented. And she desperately needs to be liberated, to be set free. And again, Paul offers her that. But there's also a third person in this, these stories of, of the church of Philippi as it starts. This one's a jailer. And he's sort of different from the other two again. He, he's, he's not wildly successful, but he's not a slave either. He, he's almost certainly a Roman soldier. Anybody working in this sort of position was either a Roman soldier or a, or a former Roman soldier. And, and so... The question is, how's the gospel going to break through to him? How's his life going to be changed? You know, he, he hasn't got questions. He's not seeking God. He, he, he's not feeling oppressed in any way. He doesn't need the intellectual discourse that, of Lydia. He, he, he doesn't need to be liberated the way the slave girl did. Yeah, this guy, his life's good. He's got a good job. He's a regular guy. What could he possibly need that Paul could offer? Listen to how we're introduced to him. Verses 22 to 27. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. See, so the moment the jailer thinks that the prisoners have escaped because the doors are flung open. He grabs his sword and he's about to kill himself. To which we want to say, dude, decaf only after nine o'clock at night. Like, just settle down. But there's a reason for this. The, the way the law worked was that, that you as a jailer, well, you were responsible for those prisoners. You had to guard them quite literally with your life. And if they got out, you would be executed. And so he knows, when he sees those doors open, he assumes that everybody would go, and so he knows the shame and the humiliation and the consequences that are coming his way. And so he decides to kill himself. Now, what do we know about this man and his relationship with God? Nothing. Nothing. He's not searching like Lydia. He, he is an oppressed or powerless like the slave girl. He's, he's a regular guy. It possibly he's spiritually indifferent until he has a crisis. There's this moment, there's this situation where his life is turned upside down and he finds, him, finds himself without hope. I, I, I meet guys like this all the time. I've known plenty of guys like this. They're just good guys. They're regular guys. You know, they work hard. They love their wife. They're trying to raise their families. Um, and life is good and life is comfortable. They know I'm a pastor, but to be honest, for most of them, it's irrelevant. Because I don't think they really need God in any way most of the time. They're not seeking God. They're not tormented. Maybe you know somebody like this. Maybe this is exactly how you're like. You're not offended by the gospel, but you're just not drawn to the gospel. You don't need a rational discourse about faith, nor do you feel oppressed. You need to be set free from anything in your life. You feel like life's good, it's comfortable, you're a regular person. 
You're living the good life. But what happens when the crisis comes? And so the jailer, when the crisis comes, he draws his sword and he prepares to end his life. And at this point, Paul intervenes. Verses 28 to 34. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of night, the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before him. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So what moves this man? In this moment of crisis, is it, is it an intellectual discussion? No. Was it that he needed to be liberated because he felt oppressed or powerless? No. What moved him was this. Compassion. And grace. That's what moved him. When Paul and Silas arrived at the doorsteps of his prison, they were bloodied and beaten. They'd been stripped and beaten with rods. They'd been flogged. Blood would have been dripping off their bodies. And, and the first impression of the jailer is what? He is just indifferent. He could care less. He does nothing about their situation. All he does is he does his command. He whacks him in the innermost part of the jail and he puts him in stocks. It's like a form of torture. He's callous. He's indifferent. He doesn't care. He shows him no compassion whatsoever until he's a recipient of grace, until he's a recipient of compassion. And then he changes. We're told in verse 33, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The callous, indifferent jailer has his life turned upside down and then he meets grace and it changes him dramatically. When he puts him into stocks, how do they act? They pray, they, they sing praises to God. They don't yell at him. They don't curse Rome. They don't do any of that. They just praise God. It's extraordinary. And when the earthquake comes and they have an opportunity to run free, they don't run free. Why? Because they know the impact that this could have on this man. That if they, for their freedom, it will cost this man his life. And so they stay. Even after all the jailer has done for them, they re repay his evil with good. Where do they ever get that idea? Jesus. Jesus. Was not the cross the ultimate expression of repaying evil with good? And so here they are, despite what this man has done, they, they offer him compassion and they offer him grace and it changes him and he wants to know what it is that they have what it is they know Lydia gets a rational conversation the slave girl gets free gets, gets freed from a demonic possession and this man he gets compassion and he, as he observes people who live in an utterly different way, who are able to live a, a, such a profoundly different life, even in the face of suffering, that he finds it so compelling, he has to know more. And so we have these three stories at the start of the church at Philippi. And, and what do we, these stories tell us? Well, at least on one level, they tell us this, that there is no one religious type of person, is there? It's not, it's not like that, that you're either a religious type of person or you're not a religious type of person because Lydia and the slave girl and the jailer, they're all completely different. I mean, you've got, you've got 
They're from different races. You've got Lydia, who's probably Middle Eastern. You've got the slave girl, who we've got no idea where she's come from. She could have come from anywhere. You've got the jailer, who's probably Roman. They come from completely different socioeconomic backgrounds. You've got Lydia, who is wealthy. You've got the slave girl, who has nothing. And you've got the, the jailer, who is working or middle class. Again, from utterly different backgrounds. They have almost nothing in common. Except Jesus. Except Jesus. See, the gospel is not for a particular type of person. It's for everybody. That's the point. And if, if, you've ever, if you're a Christian and you've ever had, felt that compulsion where you thought that person will never become a Christian, they will never want to know about Jesus, read Acts 16. Because all sorts of people in Philippi come to faith in the most unlikely of circumstances. And no one is excluded. And all of them find hope in Christ. And who leads them? Paul, a former Pharisee. You know, Paul, as a Pharisee, he would have grown up every day praying a prayer. It was a controversial prayer. Every morning he would pray these words. Blessed are you, king of the universe, for not having made me a Gentile. Blessed are you, king of the universe, for not having made me a slave. Blessed are you, king of the universe, for not having made me a woman. And here's a Pharisee. And before he came to Christ, every day he probably prayed that prayer or something like that prayer. Every day, every week, every month, year after year, he prays that prayer. And he gets to Philippi. And who are the first people to come to faith? A Gentile, a slave, a woman. Don't you love it? It seems like this guy, despite all that he thought that he knew, he's so utterly changed that these are the people that he wants to know about Jesus. See, he gets the gospel is for everyone. Now, I think this story in Acts 16 also tells us something else about the gospel. That there is no one approach to making the gospel known. There is no one size fits all. There is no one type of presentation that suits any and every circumstance. Why is this? Because the gospel is not a product to be sold. It is love to be expressed. And love is never expressed in just one single way, is it? Sometimes we express love through words and sometimes through actions and sometimes through gifts. Sometimes through acts of service, sometimes through touch. And equally, love is not always felt by everybody the same way. For some people, it's like, give me the words. For others, it's it's acts of service. For others, it's a gift. For others, it's touch. For others, it's time. The gospel is not a product to be sold. It is love to be expressed. In 1 John 4, 8 to 10, John writes these words. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how, we, how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, mission is not about creating another religion. It's not about earning our stripes or proving ourselves to God. Mission is simply an outworking of the love of God, the God who himself is love. And he invites you and I, if you know him, to be conduits of that love. That's what making the gospel is about. It's a story of love that is told to a woman by the name of Lydia. Sometimes love is just telling somebody about the God that loves them. Other times, it's in acts of compassion. That's why we we don't write anybody off. We don't refuse anybody, irrespective of their past, because it's always reflected in compassion and grace. Sometimes love is an action which so transforms another as it did the Roman jailer. And sometimes love is expressed in things like power and justice. It's daring to believe that God cares about whatever situation 
that besets you or I and that he has the capacity to do something about it. And love is expressed to say that I want to, I'm going to lean into the power of God to, to liberate you, to free you from whatever it is that besets you. And if you're watching this, I just want you to know that God is for you. That God loves you. And the gospel is for you. And it's not a product for you to buy. It's, just for, it's a love for you to know. And it's love to be expressed. And my hope is that this week, this week you'll have opportunity to know that love. Whether it be in word or action or deed. Whether it's somebody spending time with you or giving you a gift or, or an act of service. Whatever it is that you would know the love of God. And no matter who you are, that you would know the God who offers you and I this extraordinary love. Let me take a moment to pray. Father, as we go into this week, Father, I want to first of all pray for anybody that is watching, that is part of what we're doing, that, that sees himself in this story, that is perhaps saying that, yeah, I'm the one that has questions. Or I'm the one that needs to be set free because I feel oppressed at the moment. Or I'm the one that is in the midst of a crisis and I'm losing my hope. And I just need some compassion or grace. That Father, that, that they would experience whatever it is that they need to know or to hear or to feel or to experience. That they would know your love. And that, for those, and that they that love would so dramatically change them as it has changed Lydia and a slave girl and a jailer. That they would know the love of Christ. That, Father, they would make a choice to follow you. And, Father, for those that know you, myself included, Lord, that we'll be conduit to your love this week that would never see you as a product to be sold. That you are the story of the God who is love. You are the, you are the God who is love. And that would be conduit to your love this week. Father, help us not to edit who deserves your love, who gets your love, but just to, to freely give it away. To give it away in our conversations, to give it away in trusting your power, give it away in acts of compassion and grace, just to give it away. So that people's questions will be answered and their hopes will be realized. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my you will bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations, 
With truth and justice Shines like the sun in All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Yeah, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.